inna a'tainaka al-kawthar. We've given you the greatest, the most abundant good. The true advancement, the true progress in this modern world is not contrary to Islam and not just in conformity with Islam but was largely generated by Islam. How so? Think about what are the strengths of the modern world. If we take for example hygiene, Time magazine has an article years back, it's entitled The Dirty Secrets of Bath Time. And basically it says that in the year 1000 CE, the crusaders returned from the east with the news of a delightful custom. The Turkish bath, like sauna, ghusl, these things. As a result, bath houses are built all over Europe. That means that 400 years after the Muslims have received the guidance of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Muslims are making wudu five times a day, they're taking ghusl, they're washing their hands, they're brushing their teeth with siwak. Finally, 400 years later, that's reaching Europe. Europe that was so infested due to their lack of hygiene with diseases that few people survived birth and very few made it to old age. People that would brag about not bathing, people that would wear clothes until their clothes ripped off their bodies. So that's hygiene. It was brought to uh, Europe from the Muslim world 400 years late. Another strength would be medicine. The very first medical board exams ever were where? They were in the Islamic civilization, they were in Baghdad. And the reason for that is because centuries before Europe, Islam was inspired by the statement of its Prophet wasallam, that medicine is not superstition. There's a science, there's a method behind the madness as some put it. For example, the Prophet wasallam said, whomever practices medicine, وَلَمْ يُعْلَمْ مِنْهُ طِبٌّ فَهُوَ ضَامٍ It's Sunan Abi Dawood from Haytha Amr ibn Shu'ayb, from his father, from his grandfather, that whoever practices medicine without being known to be proficient in medicine, then he is liable. Meaning here in court, in front of Allah, uh, Lord of the world, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why, for example, one of the citations here, Dr. William Osler, who is the founder and the second president of the Medical Library Association, he says that the canon, the qanun, the law, the medical book of Avicenna, Ibn Sina, and irrespective of our positions from his theology, he was given reign to develop his skills, his proficiency in medicine due to the Islamic civilization. That atmosphere made it possible. And so Avicenna, he says, his book was the medical library in, in Europe for longer than any other book in history. For over 300 years, this was a reality. Another strength of the modern world, you can look at education, mathematics, like algebra, the discovery of zero. So that means the iPhone in your hand, were it not for algebra, were it not for the binary code that is the language of computers and zeros and ones, that is attributed to a Muslim scholar, right? Al-Khawarizmi of Baghdad. Also on the subject of education, the very first university on the planet, Al-Qayrawan, is attributed to the year 859, Muslim University. And the second oldest university on the planet, Al-Azhar University, the year 970. We're talking common era. Just to give you a little bit of... Uh, uh, comparison, the very first in Europe was in Italy in the year uh, 1088. In Baghdad, by the way, it was the most famous, the largest repository in the world of books called Bayt al-Hikmah, right? The House of Wisdom. And in Qurtuba, you know, Qurtuba, I can talk about the library of Qurtuba or we can discuss the, it was a hub of intellectuality. People came from far and wide. Kings would send letters to ask the governors of Qurtuba to allow their daughters and like a fleet of, of students to come study in their universities. Qurtuba had 50 hospitals, Muslim Spain had 50 hospitals, 500 years before Italy had its first hospital. Robert Brefaux in, in The Making of Humanity, he says, science is the most momentous contribution of Arab civilization to the modern world. Science owes a great deal more to the Arabs. It owes its own existence. Like he's referring to Islam. And he says, observation and experiment are the two sources of scientific knowledge. And he says, Roger Bacon, for example, anyone know who that is? Yes, yeah, scientific method. Jazakallah khairan. He says he was no more than one of the apostles of Muslim science and a method to Christian Europe. He never wearied, he just he 
never had enough. He was not ashamed of over and over again. He never wearied of declaring that knowledge of Arabic and the Arabic science was for his contemporaries the only path, the only way to true knowledge. You know, Hassan ibn al-Haytham, for example, is a creator on the moon, by the way, named after him, because of his discussions on luminosity and his discussions on the moon and the likes. This was a Muslim scholar in the ninth century. And William Draper, who's a huge European historian, he says, in the book is called The Intellectual Development of Europe, I have to deplore the systematic manner in which the literature of Europe has contrived to put out of sight our scientific obligations to the Muhammadans. That's you guys. Surely they cannot be much longer hidden. Injustice founded on religious rancor and national conceit cannot be perpetuated forever. One last thing, tolerance, free thinking and, and the likes. Adam Smith, who's the famous economist, he says, the empire of the caliphs seems to have been the very first state under which the world enjoyed that degree of tranquility which the cultivation of the sciences requires. That was the first point, to establish that much of the advancement of the modern world doesn't just agree with Islam, it was spearheaded by an Islamic civilization that was grounded in faith, a civilization of faith. So these were a people that mastered both the worlds by virtue of their Islam. This one man, alayhi salatu wasalam, comes forward, he develops a civilization of people. The Adhan, can you imagine? The Adhan is called, it rings from the seas all the way in the east, from China, all the way across to West Africa, as a result of his call, alayhi salatu wasalam, and not at the expense of developing their world because they saw it as a harvest for the hereafter and a duty to God that they had to deliver even if they wouldn't see its fruits in their lives.